Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening broadcast. Today's Dhamma, today I wanted to look at I want to talk about the idea of what it is we need to know, uh, what we need to learn from the practice. Right? We talk about satipatthana is for the purpose of attaining vipassana, it's for the purpose of gaining insight, it's for the purpose of gaining jnana, jnana udapadi. Vija Udapadi, Panya Udapadi, Aloko Udapadi. It's for gaining wisdom. I think a, a bit of a misunderstanding is, or a misconception of that is that somehow there are many things that we have to learn, or it's quite complex, or a sense that we're not learning what we have to learn. You, you hear about wisdom, right? And you think, I've been practicing for a long time, I don't see any wisdom yet. Because you have this idea that wisdom is something lofty, wisdom is something uh, perhaps intellectual or complicated. It's actually quite simple. It's, it's somewhat, sometimes, um, well, deceivingly simple anyway. My teacher Ajahn Tong said, uh, he says, when, 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 uh, when you say rising, when you watch the stomach rise and you say rising, when you know that the stomach's rising, that's wisdom. And you think, that's it? You know, why am I, why, why am I here? I, I can do this at home. It's a very important statement. When you know that the stomach is rising, that's wisdom. There's a, there's a problem, is that we're forgetful. We don't remember. We aren't wise, we're unwise. We have ayoni somanasikara. Instead of just knowing that the stomach is rising or knowing that seeing is seeing, mm. we know a lot more. We know too much. Too much and not enough. Everything and nothing. We know all the details about so many things. We as, as a human species seem bent on learning everything collecting as much useless information as we can, mostly useless. And by useless, uh, useless I mean by Buddhist standards. Useless in the sense that they don't actually make us happy, the things we learn. They don't actually bring peace. How much learning we need just to do some job that ends up fulfilling some function that does very little to promote well-being, or um, learning skills that in the end are such a roundabout way of promoting any sort of goodness, if at all, and in fact often promote unwholesomeness. How, man, how many skills, how much learning, how much knowledge is there out there that ends up being totally useless, or worse, uh, harmful? When I was young, we used to play these, uh, on, these computer games. Back before they had online computer games, we used to play uh, St StarCraft, WarCraft. And you could spend hours when we would play these battle simulations. And you could spend hours. We would spend all night, we would stay awake all night playing. 
I'm sure to some of you this all sounds like, yeah, I mean, it's a, this is what we do now. I, mean, I think this is what people do now. But, uh, but it, you, you learn so much and you get these skills, wonderful skills, and you get really good at these games or sports, right? Or acting or mathematics, physics. All these wonderful things we're able to build, computers and spacecraft. So much learning, even languages. How much time we have to spend learning languages just to talk to each other. And then we die and forget it all, lose the languages and have to gain them all again. So no, the knowledge that we hope to gain from meditation is, is quite different. We hope to come to know that, oh right, yes, when the stomach rises, that's rising. It's not good, it's not bad, it's not me, it's not mine. But to be a little more precise, if you like to get some, you know, clear up the doubt, it's easy to find doubt in regards to this. What is the wisdom? What am I trying to learn? One time Ajahn Tong said to me that there are four things. There's only four things you have to learn. The first one is called uh, Nama Rupa, number one. Number two, uh, Tilakana. And number three, Magga. Number four, Pala. These are the Pali words. Uh, nama Rupa. This means, uh, Nama means the immaterial. Rupa means material. There are only two aspects to reality. The first thing you have to come to understand if you want to practice meditation, is that there's only two parts to reality. There's the immaterial and there's the material. The material is the, the physical aspect of experience. When you walk, you feel the tension or the hardness or the softness and the heat and the cold. And when you sit, you feel the tension and, and so on. Movements of the body, uh, sensations in the body, these are, these are material. When you touch something, the touching, the feeling of hardness or softness, that's material. But the immaterial is the knowing of it. The knowing of it and all the uh, concomitant qualities of the knowing, when you like and dislike and all that, that's all material, immaterial. That's reality. That's what's real. The first thing you have to learn is what's real. It's the first step in meditation. We can't progress until you're clear. When you move the right foot, there's an experience of the, of the, the pressure and the, the cold or the, the movement of the wind and so on. Yeah. And that arises, and that's physical. And there's the knowing of it as well. When the stomach rises, your mind knows. There's the stomach, there's the rising, and there's the, there's the rising movement, and there's the mind, but there's no stomach. Stomach is all produced in the brain, in the mind. Not the brain, the mind. The brain also doesn't exist. These are concepts we give rise to. If you think of the brain, or the brain doesn't exist, what do you mean the brain doesn't exist? Besides as a concept, there's no existence. We have the brain is actually connected. It's just a part of the body, right? It's, it, it extends into the central nervous system and all that. There's no such thing as the brain. It's just a concept that we apply to certain mental and physical 
aspects of experience. There's no body, there's no room, we're not sitting in a room. There's not even any space, you know, but space is interesting because space is only a part of matter, it doesn't actually exist. It's only, it only comes to being because of, of matter, it's a part, a derived quality of matter. It does exist, but exists only, only in, in regards to matter. The mind doesn't take up space. But as not to get too complicated, very simply, the only thing you have to know is that body and mind, material, immaterial, reality is only made up of these two things. Reality is, is made up of experiences. When you see something, there's the physical light, and there's the eye, and then there's the, the knowing of it. Sometimes with your eyes open, you're, you don't actually see something in front of you. Your mind is somewhere else, even though your eyes are open. The mind isn't there. Sound, hearing requires sound, the physical, the ear. It also requires the mind. Of course, sometimes you're absorbed in something and someone calls your name and you don't hear it. The mind. That's the immaterial. Two things required for experience, for seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. You need material, immaterial. This is the first thing you have to learn. The second thing we have to learn is the three characteristics, tilakkana. Tit means three, lakkana means characteristic. They're also called samanya lakkana. Samanya means uh, universal or, or, yeah, universal basically. Common to all. I mean, see, it's the three characteristics of just about everything. The three characteristics, of course, are impermanence, instability, uncertainty, unreliability, unpredictability, all that. Suffering, stress, dissatisfaction, inability to satisfy, unhappiness, non-happiness, basically not being happiness, and non-self, uncontrollability, insubstantiality. This is the second thing you have to learn, and this is really what you start to see through the practice. You start to re readjust your understanding about things. You see for the first time how much suffering we're causing ourselves. And you start to see to, 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 to see uh, the mistakes you're making. You know, you're making a mistake when you cling, when you want, when you expect. Because reality is inconstant, unpredictable, unsatisfying, can't satisfy, and uncontrollable, insubstantial not self. It has no entity, no, no substantiality of its own. Again, these three things are not some mystery. Everyone reads about these and they think, I don't see those things. I always have given this talk several times about how meditators will come and say, I can't, I'm not progressing. I just sit here and, and it, you know, my mind is in chaos and it's unpleasant and I can't control it, you know. How can I progress in, in this rate? This is, this is progress. Seeing that your mind is unpredictable, chaotic, is you know, a cause of great stress. Not all the clinging is a cause of st great stress. That, we're clinging to things that can't possibly satisfy us. That's why we're stressed. It's out of control. You can't control, you can't predict. Expectations have no bearing on reality. We act as though our expectations are going to somehow dictate reality. It's quite silly, isn't it? Somehow because we want things to be a certain way, that they're going to be that way. 
such an odd idea, an odd concept. And yet that's how we act. So you start to change this. You start to see that uh, wants, expectations, it's all uh, highly problematic. It's the main cause of suffering. We can't predict, we can't expect. It doesn't really turn out the way we want. It's unreliable. This is the main insight. This is what starts to loosen up the mind and free us from our bondage, from this obsession that we have with pleasure and, and displeasure, you know, attaining pleasure and, and removing or, or destroying, or avoiding displeasure. Until eventually we start to we start to uh, start to see things with equanimity. So the second is these characteristics. This is the beginning of the path. The three characteristics are really the beginning of insight. As soon as you start, once you start to see these, you, you can say you've started on the path. Or, or you've opened the door, let's say. Seeing these is like the, the door right before, when you open the door and you say, that's where I want to go. So you open the door. The next one is Magga, it's the path. And that's what you walk. That's what you, that's what all the meditators here are on. They're cultivating the path. The first few days are just spent um, aligning yourself with the past. In fact, some of you are still on this stage. But as you go along, you, see, you start to three, see the three characteristics. It'll come. You don't have, these are not things you have to look for. All of these insights are like the, the stripes on a tiger. You don't have to look for them. Once you see the tiger, you say, there's the tiger. Yep, I see its stripes. They're right there with the tiger. You don't have to look for them. They're not hard to find. These are not complex or, or difficult things to understand. They're just, they're hidden to us because we're blind, because we don't look. Once we look, we'll see. So Magga is as you start to progress and you start to see deeper the three, no, the three characteristics, and I've talked about this before, the, in detail the path. I won't go into detail here. Um, but basically you start to see that uh, Reality is inconstant. It arises and ceases. It's it's um, not a, not actually suffering itself, but only suffering because we cling to it, because we have expectations about it. And if we stop that, we start to turn our way. We start to we start to desire and incline towards peace and freedom. We start to lose our desire for any sort of arisen experience, and the mind starts to quiet and starts to become quite uh, certain and sure of, of the nature of reality. It sees it so clearly and so consistently that there's clearly nothing worth clinging to. There's no benefit that comes from holding on. I mean, this is what you gain at the culmination of the path. So this is the what you need to go through. For those of you practicing at home, it's much longer and slower and more difficult path. Coming here might seem more difficult. Those meditators who are here must certainly feel how difficult it is. But it's so much easier in comparison. It's not years and years or lifetimes of struggling just to gain basic insight into reality. There's so much insight that comes from being here so much pur purification and, and cleansing that goes on in the mind, freeing yourself. In such a short time, it's a great blessing. And so all you need is patience and you have to walk the path. This is the main portion of our undertaking, is to follow the path and to see clearly and to cultivate and accumulate this understanding of the three characteristics and the nature of reality is not worth clinging to.
learning to let go. And so the fourth is pala, this is the fruit, when the mind finally lets go. At the end of the path, the mind sees so clearly it, 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 it releases, it lets go. No more seeking, no more racing out to see. What's that? I want to see it. What's that? I want to hear it. The mind no longer. Oh no, what's going on over here? No longer. The mind gets fed up and says, enough, enough with you all. And it drops, it, it, it quiets, it becomes perfectly and completely silent. There's cessation even, cessation of arisen experience. This is Nibbana. And then the Nibbana is something that is unarisen. And so the mind enters into an unarisen state, which is pure peace. This is the final wisdom. This is might not sound like wisdom, actually, but it is the most powerful wisdom. And maybe the word wisdom is, in English, we, we use, we have too much baggage surrounding that term, but banya, ba, means perfectly, rightly, strongly, Nya knowledge to know. So when you know nibbana, nirvana, it's it's the highest knowledge. To know nibbana, there's nothing greater. There's nothing that even compares. There's nothing that's anything close to the experience of nibbana in terms of changing who you are, changing your life, changing your direction, changing your mind, freeing you from stress and suffering. But still quite simple. There's nothing hard to understand. It's a bit scary, I suppose. Ooh, cessation. But I don't want to cease, I want to go. What'll happen to me, right? If there were a me, you know. But there's nothing hard to understand about these things. They're quite simple. Well, maybe that's not true. I think they are hard to understand, but the problem is that we make more out of them than they actually are. They're hard for us to understand because we act and, and we function on such a more complex level. An enlightened being is so much simpler. If you read the Buddha's text, they seem somewhat aggravatingly simple. The Buddha will give a talk just about seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. And if you're not a Buddhist meditator, you think, this is dumb, you know, this is too... You might think how, how simplistic this is, or, or meaningless. You just can't make head or tail of it. It's like, why is he talking about seeing? I remember hearing about Buddhism, and I was in a guidebook when I was in Thailand, and it said, uh, the Buddha taught that when you walk, just walk, when you stand, just stand, or something like that. And I thought, well, that's kind of, yeah, okay. I was trying to get it, but inside I'm thinking, oh, that's it? What does, what's he even talking about? What does that mean? Doesn't look like wisdom. This doesn't seem anything to do with wisdom. I went to Thailand looking for wisdom. When I went to the meditation center, I asked. they asked me, curiously, they asked me, why are you here? What do you hope to get from it? And I said, I would like to gain wisdom. Right, first thing out of my mouth. It was what I was looking for. But boy, the, the change that went in my understanding of, this change that came in my understanding of what wisdom was, I realized how foolish, how, how uh, ignorant I was of what wisdom really means. Wisdom has nothing to do with knowledge, with, with thinking or concepts. Wisdom is, when the stomach rises, you know that it's rising. That's wisdom. Very, very profound, yet yeah, very simple. So there you go, that's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in.